Let's go ahead and get started today. Um, in terms of what we would like to do today, there's a couple of different big topics we'd love to do. It's kind of like keep on going with the whole notion of sheets, views, and if you're putting things on them, she's trying to make your views look the way you would like them to be. So, within the whole notion of views and ultimately getting them to sheets, it's the whole notion of, we talked a little about the notion of cropping and a little bit about filtering, but let's take a much closer look at that, about getting the right information that you want to actually have appearing on the sheets there. Um, we're also going to take a look at really how you start adding information to the sheet. So we'll look at the whole notion of annotating. And as we're talking about annotating, there's going to be a whole series of different things that will come up there. We'll talk about dimensions. We'll talk about text. We're going to talk about a very special kind of thing we can put on sheets, which are called tags. And tags is what will lose in the discussion of really all the different parts in our database and how we can actually access that information in other ways. So we tend to be looking at it in a very graphical form. There's another way to look at it in a very tabular way called schedules. So we'll take a look at how we create schedules. And we'll map. We'll start to talk about, oh, the whole notion of how you do like a window schedule or a door schedule. We looked at that a little bit before. But we'll also talk about rooms and room schedules and how we can compute the areas of rooms and things like that and get all that stuff out of here. So a lot of different things in here in terms of really just going through getting our uh, sheets and views in place and ultimately sort of getting them on the sheets that you can then share. But really, it doesn't have to be sheets. We'll actually talk about how we can you know, go ahead and take this the uh, sheet views as well as the 3D model. You share that. We'll talk about some of the ways you can get that because now you can actually do some really incredible things. Getting your uh, models on things like iPads, iPhones, Androids, like anything. You can basically you can go ahead and like uh, pull your model for a lot of different um, locations. Okay. In terms of just following up with some uh, tactical stuff, uh, we have been producing the videos. They are all showing up now, or at least th six of them are showing up now. So let me get the last two started uploading here, just as we're even speaking, on uh, YouTube. What, um, if you go to YouTube, let me tell you how you go ahead and find that stuff. If you go to YouTube, what I want you to do is go ahead and look for a channel called Bimtopia. Okay, B-I-M-T-O-P-I-A. So if you go through and search for Bimtopia, Actually, let me do this. Actually, I'll, I'll fix this sort of over dynamically here. Can I have the same spot? And I'll make that work for you there. Okay, put it up. Those are all located. That's good there. Let me do this. Let me go back to all the videos that are there. See a little bit how things work in the background here. Those are the last four videos that I uploaded. BIM Boot Camp, Session 1, Group A, Session 1, Group B, Session 2, Group A, Session whatever. It's all that type of stuff. We're basically producing those and uploading as we speak. What I typically do is I actually make a playlist out of these things. So what I'll do is I'll say, let me take all these different things. Say we'll add them into a new playlist. What do we call this? We'll call this Stanford BIM Bootcamp. Okay, 2012, make it a public playlist, create the playlist. Okay, so now what will happen is if you go on out there to, and why don't you go ahead and try this on your side because I think you should be able to see it. Go ahead and go to YouTube if you can and try searching for Vimtopia. And within Vimtopia, oh, let's see if we can find on the channel, basically you're looking for the playlist because if we can find the playlist, what's going on here? Go to my little channel. Featured videos, how do you actually find the playlists in here? Featured playlists, uh, let's see if we can have this in here. That's how I select the play. oh, select playlist to add, that looks like a good thing. Let's add that to the top of the list so you can find that easily. I swear I just did that. Oh, it's down there, well we can't have it way down there at the bottom of the list. Up there, say apply that. 
So I think that now when you go here, you'll find the Stanford BIM Bootcamp video playlist. And if you go through there, you'll have all the different sessions. Okay, and I'm just going to keep on rolling in there. Like I've made it up through session three, A and B, but the second upload is there, then it's just session four and session five, that keep my ID list. So it's always your A, their B, and uh, we'll simply have adding up these in there. If you need to find them, YouTube is a great way to distribute the video. Okay, let's get out of that. Let's go ahead and actually get back into Revit. And, oh, okay, stop there. One second. So, all that stuff in terms of finding videos on YouTube make enough sense? It's been that you guys are familiar with that. Try to explain that to the faculty around here. It's like, oh, we'll get the playlist on. It's it's hard. Okay. I'm gonna have to excise that from the video. <laughs> I didn't say that. That was someone who sounds like me. Okay, to get ourselves started today, which would actually be very helpful. Does anyone have a model that has some doors, windows, all those things like that in it? And you can probably all go ahead and share with us, because I just assume go ahead and work with one of yours and kind of use it as an example as opposed to can make the whole new one. So does anyone have a model they can volunteer? You have a model they can volunteer. Can you go ahead and put it on the L drive? And then uh, we'll go ahead and pick that up. What's that? Put it out, put it inside Vim Bootcamp. Um, if there's not a day, three, or something like that, Wednesday, let's put it in there. I'll, go, I'll be looking for it from the other side, too. So we'll see if we can get it from both sides. Let us see. Yeah, I keep on making up boring examples that don't really look like real buildings. So it's much more interesting if we actually have a real building to work with. So let me go on out there, see if I can find that. I'll go through and connect to the L drive. I spent a lot of time last night just kind of messing around with my PC, trying to figure out why it was so incredibly slow, because it was really incredibly slow. And so we'll see if it does any better today. Oops, not that. There we go, BIM Bootcamp. Okay, so where are we? Where'd you go ahead and put it? Right there. Ah, very good, thank you. <laughs> You're too kind. I'm not sure if it's fully uploaded. What's that? I don't think it was fully uploaded. I think not. Okay, it's still doing its thing. It's a coming. All right, it's still coming. How big is it all together? Let's see if it is there. 11.452, it's looking fairly whole right now. Voila, okay. We have a building, a little research station. So let's go ahead and talk about this. So, never having seen this before, let's go ahead and take a look at like uh, how you go and turn some of these different things. Um, the idea is, okay, we see your basic model there. That's looking pretty good in terms of what's going. It's a nice, simple building. You can easily imagine students building this them that's themselves. Cheap, right? That's exactly. It's inexpensive. We can talk up all the good things that are going on with this building. Okay, some windows on the back side, got some overhangs. Looks like you're on a nice slab. That is actually looking pretty good. And you have this kind of nice cropped view, and that's looking pretty good too. Actually, let's talk about views just right from the start in terms of all the different views you might want to create because I just did something which you may not want me to have done, which is I'm going ahead and I'm opening around this view that's all cropped and everything. You probably want that to put on a sheet and you want to kind of keep that view. Yes. Well, that's why I, I made the mistake and then caught the WP. Review on the 3D on Southwest. Beautiful. So it's not on the sheet anymore. No worries. Let's talk about that in terms of all these different things you can do. There's this thing over here, the 3D view that has the little brackets on it. That's kind of the default 3D view. You keep on coming back to that. You tend to kind of keep on coming back and making changes to it. The good thing to do is whenever you have something that you want to isolate and kind of put off somewhere in a safe state, go ahead and duplicate that and make a snapshot of it at this point. 
Okay, so always go through, take that thing, and you're going to be doing this a lot. Just keep on saying duplicate the view. I'll call it, oh, kind of, oh, it's my front left aerial, whatever it is. It's my presentation. Say okay to that. It's now locked in there. The nice thing about front left aerial now is a view as opposed to 3D view down here. This 3D view, I can actually even turn off the cropping if I want to and orbit away, do whatever I want to do to this view. So it's still moving around and I'm making changes to it. Oh, maybe I'll change it to realistic, whatever it is. I'm making some sort of changes to it. Okay, but what's going to happen is front left aerial over here is going to stay that same place. So go ahead and every time you make a new camera, when you duplicate it, you're really making a new camera and then you can be independent of each other. So it's nice to be thinking about you know, the ones in the presentation views that are staying on the sheets versus your working views that you're going to keep on mucking around with. Okay, now, if you're going ahead and working with a view like this, and that's a 3D view, there's all these things we'll talk about in just a minute about in terms of annotations and stuff like that. A funny attribute about 3D views is that if you want to go ahead and add any sort of annotations to them, adding text or something like that in 3D space is a little odd. Depends on how it works. So what happens is, if I want to go ahead and put an annotation on here, And I'll put something on here. Oh, hang on. That was very anticlimactic. I'll put a piece of text in here. What I'm going to do is kind of drag out a piece of text. It's still looking strange to me. Hang on a second. That's OK. Hmm. I'll put a piece of text out here. OK, this is some text. Notice it's incredibly small text. You cannot see it now. Turns out text, you know, like a lot of different things in Revit, you know, have properties to them. And this is a piece of text which is going to be pretty at 3 30 seconds of an inch tall. Okay, so this is 3 30 seconds of an inch tall at quarter scale. I'm going to talk about text and scale and how some of these things look together. When we go through and choose a scale for the text, like 3 30 seconds of an inch, or I can choose a different property. Let's see if I have anything bigger there. Oh, what? One makes it like one quarter. That'll be a little bit bigger. Okay. The scale that we're going ahead and choosing is actually the printed scale. So the scale that's printed versus the drawings are sort of related to each other by the scale of the drawing. So let me show what I mean. Okay. That scale right now is that, that text is going to show up one quarter inch tall if we print it. If I change the scale of the drawing to one eighth scale, what's going to happen is the text is twice as big relative to it. Okay, as it was before. On the other hand, if I change it up to half scale, it gets even sort of smaller. So the text is actually a fixed size relative to the piece of paper, where the drawing is actually changing its size relative to the piece of paper. So what the net effect that you're seeing is it looks like the text is changing size. It's really actually that the drawing is changing size. The text is staying the same size all the time. Okay. And if you want to go through and create some text in different sizes, let me go ahead and put that back to quarter scale. Here's some text. Again, it just has properties. If a quarter inch aerial isn't what you wanted, if you wanted to have a half inch of chalk forward bowl or something like that, how would you do that? It's kind of the same way we do every time we want to create something of a new type. We basically say edit the type. We duplicate the type and we give it a new name always. So I'll say, oh, let's say half inch. I'll make it three eighths. Half inch would be pretty big. See if I can do Comic Sans. That's a font everyone hates. Actually, there's some really nice handwritten fonts. I should give you some of those that look more like you know handwriting, like architectural printing. There's a, some. I should put some of those out on the server for you. But let's go ahead and do that. Um, we now have this new type available. What we do to change it is we just change the type down here. Do I have Comic Sans in there? Yeah, I do. I can change it to that. Or let me see if I can actually find the one that I like better. <laughs> no, it's not loaded on this machine. I have one called Freehand that I like. There's a number of ones that just, you know, whatever. Choose things that look nice. Convey what you want. Okay, there's Comic Sans. We'll change the text size to be 3 8 of an inch. We can decide whether we want it to be bold, if we want it to be a color, whatever it is we want it to do. 
We can just have different text styles for different things, and we'll say OK. And then it showed up there. Now, a good way to think about text is actually not to think about it literally in terms of the size, but to actually start coming up with different types of functions. That we do. So in my drawings, I tend to have more plan notes. I have electrical plan notes. I have all these different sort of standard styles that I use for different functions. And I just change the style, I change the characteristics for the function based on how I need to. But that's actually, if you could start thinking about things in terms of their function as opposed to literally what the font size is, that will give you a really quick way to change things. Because, for example, if you're going to put all the room labels in, you want to make the room labels bigger or smaller. If they're all tagged as the room label type, you'll be able to change them all in uh, uh, a quick, like, you know, single operation as opposed to going through and choosing to them all independently and having to change the text style all stuff one by one. Okay, so text is sort of good for doing things like that. Now, where I went down this rat hole in terms of talking about the text is relative to the 3D view, watch this. The cool thing about text, or the sort of hard thing about annotations in a 3D view, is when you orbit the view, it's a little bit weird about what happens. Okay, so let's talk about that. You know, in 3D views, unlike 2D views, one thing you want to think about doing for 3D views is if you're going to add any annotations to them, not just going to catch the camera, but you can actually do this thing when you walk through the view. And it's available in 2013. I don't think it was in 2012. But down here at the bottom, there's a little thing where there's the house and it's an unlocked 3D view. If you lock it, okay, the nice thing is no one can accidentally start moving it around. Okay, so if you put dimensions, annotations, whatever you put on there, you can add annotations to this. Okay, but it's nice to go through and lock it in there. Now, I just put sort of a dumb text annotation in here. That's OK. I can go ahead and put some annotations that are a little more meaningful. For example, one of the annotations we're going to talk about in a little while is a tag. A tag is actually basically it's a window into some database value for one of the objects that you're looking at. So we can tag things based on uh, most things have an ID number or mark that we can go ahead and report. We can go report a uh, family type, which reports any of the different database attributes about the object. Okay, do this thing called a tag. So what a tag looks like, just so you get a sense of it, is I'll tag something. Let's see if I can tag a window. I'll pull that out. It's kind of very small in scale, but what you'll see is now, that is window 74. What does that mean? That probably is it's either the type number, or it could be the individual ID, but it's actually a specific window number. Okay, It's one of the properties of the database. If I go to the window itself and take a look at this, which is actually part of a group, so I'm going to have to edit the group to actually get to the individual one. Oh, what will I see? It's not the individual mark. I think it's probably the type mark. There it is. It's the type mark. So type mark is really a notion of like a window ID. Now, Revit by default is all the windows with different numbers that may or may not make sense to you. You might want to use a different scheme. When I go through, I tend to have window A, window B, window C, something like that. So if this is going to be our window A for it, what I can do is change it to A for all these windows of that type. When I change that, I'm going to finish up the group. You'll see the tag actually shows it there. It's window A. I'm going to go ahead and tag something else. We'll tag that one over there. I think that's also going to be a window A because it looks like it's pretty much the same window. See if I can get this to work. The nice thing about tags, tags are actually bi-directional in the same way that dimensions are bi-directional. So that is window type A as we speak about it right now. If you want to go ahead and change the designation of window A to be window B, okay, I've changed it. It's changed both of them. So what I'm able to do is Next is sort of a very interesting little window in the database in that I not only can report the information out of the database, I can actually change the information in the database too. So text is sort of very useful as opposed to text because text, the stupid thing about text is it's sort of it's like lines. They just stay lines, it just stays text, nothing updates and kind of changes itself dynamically. Tags actually lets you get in there and start mucking around mm -hmm. and change the data values as you go. Now, this is not really a great use of these in the 3D view, so I'll take them out there. Let's go ahead and look at some other views, plus some of the 2D views, and we'll kind of see how this is all working together. OK, 
Okay, so over here on first floor, let's go back over to first floor and take a look at this. Okay, so you got this nicely cropped view right now. It's got it all kind of close into where we want it. That's what we do. We're liking that. Because if you have too much stuff when you lay it out on sheets, it tends to just get to be, you know, it's spilling over the edges. It doesn't fit nicely into the sheets and stuff like that. So I'm liking this as a first floor view. So what we want to do is start thinking about this view. We got the cropping down looking pretty good. Let's think about filtering and adding some annotations to it. So we've got this good looking view over here. Let's think about the different type of views we might want to have. I could go ahead and have, this is sort of an overall floor plan that shows me everything. That's looking pretty good. We can add some information to that just to kind of give people a sense of scale. Yes? I was wondering, uh, the course we didn't find thing follow on the sheets as well? or Yes. So it's whether it's the setting in the view itself. Exactly. And follow the, the sheets are relatively dumb about this. They'll just go ahead and display whatever the view is. So if your view is coarse, it'll show it coarse on the sheets. If your view is shaded, it'll show it shaded on the sheets. Whatever you have your view set to is the way it'll show up. The sheets don't add any intelligence. What about the fine line thing? Ah, no. The fine line thing, it, it, the fine line thing, it, it will always plot the view using the thick lines, using the proper plotting loops. So that's this issue. Let's zoom on in here. You might remember yesterday, oh, under the view tab, there's this notion of thin line view versus kind of the actual plotted line weights. And the plotted line weights will always show the plotting weights as opposed to your thin weights. That's one of the few things that uh, get lost in the translation. So let's think about what we can do here. One thing we can do, well, let me start adding some dimensions and some annotations to this, and then we'll go back and I'll go back and do the filtering. Okay. We want to go ahead and put some dimensions on this building. And here's the way I typically dimension things. We can think about whether we're going to dimension to the outside faces of the wall, the faces of the core, the center lines. Okay. I tend to like to dimension the faces of the core, because that's the way I think you frame it. Okay, but everyone has sort of different philosophies about how to do this. Let me kind of show you what I would probably do, and you can sort of adopt kind of the scheme that you think is going to work best. All I'm going to ask is that you ultimately, that you're consistent. You know, you can go ahead and use any scheme you want to, just be consistent about it, which one you want to use. So we are looking at a view, everything about the view, most of the things over here, architecture, structures, and systems, anything we do with those tools, we're really going to show up at all of these views. It's actually affecting the model. Things that we're going to do today under the annotate tab are different. They don't really affect the entire model. They are things that only affect one specific view. So annotations are local to a view. They don't actually extend across the model. So if we go to the annotation tab, take a look at some things. The first thing we'll probably start off with is dimensions. We have a line, linear, and angular. We have all sorts of things we can do in terms of uh, whether we're following things at an uh, angle or just, uh, whether we want to follow them at whatever angle we're going or whether we want to help them resolve to like uh, horizontal and vertical. But let's choose a, uh, a line and kind of zoom on in and kind of take a look at how we could apply that. Oh, let's think about how we even want to do this. Generally, when I'm dimensioning a building like this, we'll approach it two ways. I tend to like to have an overall dimension, so this dimension from end to end of the building, so someone can walk out there and real quickly say, that building's 30 feet long or 20 feet, whatever it is. So an overall dimension from here to here, from here to here. And then within that, I'll often have kind of sub-dimensions, so here to here and to there, so you can start seeing the sizes of the rooms here to here, to here to here, so you can start seeing, you know, it's typically overall, and then I'll usually dimension to every intersecting wall, okay, and have two lines of dimensions, one after the other. So what that would look like is something like this. I'll get my dimensioning tool. I'll come on down and I'm going to start dimensioning now. You get to choose what you would like to try to prefer, and it's by default set to wall center lines, which is probably not the best thing. I'm going to change it to be a face of the core. That'll try to go to the core because that's the way I like to do it. And I'll come on over here, and what'll happen is it'll try to grab cores. So if I get in close, I'm not sure if you can see this, I'll turn on the thin line view so you can sort of see that better. It'll try to grab cores. See, it's sort of like, you know, it's going to get the faces, but if we try, it'll get that guy there. So I'm going to choose that face of the core right there. I'm going to just use my mouse to roll on out, zoom on over to this side. I'm going to get that face of the core over there. 
can't. What's happened? I've chosen two good reference points. As long as I'm choosing reference lines in geometry, it will keep on adding witness lines to point to those reference points. As soon as I then pull out and drop it out here somewhere in space, okay, that'll now be a dimension. So it's always click to a reference line, click to a reference line, click all your references, then put it out in the drawing area. The drawing area is the which finally makes it an external dimension. Let me do another one of those, and then we'll give you a chance to sort of play with that and experiment a little bit. We'll say aligned again. Um, once again, I'm going to grab this side over here. This time, I'm going to get that wall right there. I could really go to either side of the wall. It doesn't really matter. It just has to be one or the other. Maybe I'll go to that side. But try to be consistent about it, whether you're a left side or a right side person. Come over here. And what's going to happen is when I pull this one, I'm not sure if you can see it. Actually, it sort of snaps right there at some reasonable distance relative to the size of the text. So I'll drop it in there. Now, as I've done this, you may note that the dimensions are a little odd because we weren't really paying about them, attention to them in terms of like a framing dimensions. Yeah. The reality is, usually I'll go back and clean things up a little bit. The truth is, okay, if you ever put out plans, especially for wood frame construction, that show anything finer than a quarter of an inch, even a quarter of an inch is really pushing it, other than like a half of an inch, good luck as to whether or not it's actually going to get built that way because most of the framing that goes on here, people just aren't quite that precise. Never, ever, ever put out those three decimal points of precision or something like that, because no one has calipers out there for what they're doing. Yeah, we try to tend to make things fairly big and even, so even for this, I might go ahead and adjust it so it's actually 30 feet long altogether, and then, oh, we can think about, you know, what the condition is between these two. This nice even increments tends to be the way we buy materials, and we buy things in four foot wide sheets or three foot wide sheets. We tend to work, yeah, we almost always work to even increments. And what will usually happen is the slab will be the part that gets poured first. Some of them out there, they'll form out, it'll be exactly 30, and then it'll be much smaller than this. Okay, so you can think about that. If I want to make a small little adjustment here while I'm working, I can. Let me go ahead and I'll just choose that wall over there and say, hey, let's just round that out to an even 30. Now what's going to happen, theoretically, as that wall moves, with any luck, the roof and the floor moved a little bit with it. You never quite up. You over here, 12 foot 6 and a half. I'll live with 12 foot 6 and a half. Halves aren't so bad. You know, it's kind of, you're working with half inch sheet rock or something like that. But I now have two different dimensions. I have an outer overall and I have this inner kind of wall wall. Okay? And what you tend to like to do is do that in both directions. So I'd say, oh, over on this wall here, let's do something similar. I'll go from out here. Out here. Notice that because I have faces of core, I don't have to get really precise. It's doing a pretty good job of grabbing the faces for me. So here's my overall. And then I'll do another one here. I might zoom in there. Do I trust that you got the core? I'm not sure. There's a core. There's a core. And then finally, there's a core. And pull that out there. And again, you can adjust them a little bit. But that's the basic story of dimensions. You know, as you're going through and dimensioning, this is probably sufficient to build this building. See if this is lining up with that one. Actually, we have all the dimensions I would need. I, I posit that you could build a building with these certain dimensions. Yeah. You could go ahead and give me some more dimensions about how far here and here is. I assume most people will assume that's going to line up with that wall there. But you don't need to sort of put dimensions to every piece of furniture and between and everything. The next thing, if you're going to put some more dimensions on that you might want to do, which would be the next layer, I'll often include, is actually for windows, for the doors or windows. And for that, kind of a weird thing tends to happen. Framers tend to dimension those to the center line of the windows as opposed to the outer edges. We get it's a choice. You kind of go either way with that. So I might, just to be very complete about this, say, hey, let me give myself another dimension over here on the front side. Hopefully it'll be the same dimension as on the back side. So I'll put an overall in here, but then I would say, let's do something like this. I'll go from, oops, I actually grab something wrong that way. I want to grab that wall to the center line of this window, center line of that window. I'm just going to grab all those center lines.
Okay, and there they all are. And we can decide what we want to do about the fact that it's kind of an odd thing there. Okay, a couple things to watch out for relative to the flank. One is I actually suck a little shy if I would like to add one more line to kind of complete the story because I sort of stopped a little shy right there. I kind of goofed, but what we can do is choose an existing dimension and I'll say edit the witness lines. That gives you the option of going back and adding some more. Okay, so you can put that back in. So anything you sort of omit by accident, say edit the witness line. You choose the witness line or the dimension line. So you edit it, edit it again. Something else that is a little strange about the floor plan that we can kind of think about, and this is again just something for us to kind of think about how we want to display it. As I see, you actually have some groovy windows that are up a little high for some ventilation and stuff like that, and they're not showing up in the floor plan right now. Okay, so thinking about that, we can think about how to make them show up in the floor plan. Here's what you might want to do. Oops. This is going to be something called plan regions. And actually, let's put it up under this category. Because within this is the whole notion of view range. Okay. The category of like what actually shows up and doesn't show up. Okay, we often think about it in terms of the XY and the cropping that way. We actually have control over the Z too about how much is showing up here. And for the floor plan, what's happening here is we're cutting four feet off the ground, pushing down. Okay, and that's what we're seeing here. So we're catching all these doors and windows. Four feet tends to be a pretty good height. It's a really good height. It catches like kitchen countertops and things like that. Three feet is a pretty good, or four feet is a pretty good height for catching most everything that you need. It's not so good for these little high windows that are probably five or six feet off the ground or something like that. So, a couple things you can do. We can go ahead and adjust the view range of the entire drawing. I could say, okay, this thing's at four feet. Let me raise it up to like six feet, something like that, and get the higher windows that way. And how you would do that is the, here's the view. The view has some properties, including something called the view range. And the notion of really how high it is cut is under there. The cut plane is at four feet. So I can say, okay, four feet. No worries. Let me change that to six feet. I'll say, okay. And you'll see all of a sudden those things start showing up. Here's a window back here, and there actually is a window over there. Now, Moving things like that, just kind of for the entire drawing, may not always create the right effect because if you really want, for the most part, things to be down at four feet and you want to catch a specific area, well, you might get some weird damage or there might be weird things that happen if these drop out when you raise them up. So let me advocate a different strategy that may be more effective. Here's the deal. You got the view range. Let me put that back down to four. Here's the view range for the overall drawing. You're thinking, okay, that's pretty good. What I'd really love to do is take that view range and just in a very small space, like right here and right here, go ahead and have a separate view range that really just operates on that little area instead. And that's something called a plan region. So if you have that and you have some sort of high window or just something that's not showing in the plan view because it's at a different elevation, you want to include it, here's how you do that. Under the View tab, there's actually something, oh, we have all these funny things in here, including different types of plans. Let me see if I can find Plan Region in here. I think Plan Region is actually under the plans. It's just one of the choices there. You can create new plans or you can actually create a Plan Region. And Plan Regions look like this. You choose Plan Region. You basically go ahead and choose some area that you want to sort of have a different height for. And I can just draw this using my pink line rules. Okay. And for that little area within that pink boundary, I can choose a view range, maybe give it a different view range just for that area. So I'll say OK. And when I finish it, OK, doesn't look any different. Now, that little green line that you're seeing right there, that's just to help you understand that it's there. It's not going to print out. No one else is going to see that. That's just to let you know that that's got a little something special going on over there. Okay, so if you do have something like that, kind of a plan, a different area where you want to sort of be able to highlight something a little bit different, you can use plan regions to do that. So again, where do you find that? Let me do another one. I'll say plan region. It's up under the view tab. 
right under the floor plan, you'll find plan region. Let me create another little one. I know there's a little window over here too. So I'll make a nice little box over there. I'll change that also to be six feet. That way we'll get them all. And when I finish it, okay, there we got it. Now, if it, you get it wrong, you need to shrink it up or something like that, you can go ahead and pull these boundaries in, really get very tight so you're not getting excess in that region if you really want to make sure that it's quite close to what it, uh, the, the area of interest. Okay, so we've been adding some dimensions in here. Now, how are dimensions feeling? Got to get the sort of idea of the dimensions? It's pretty much choose reference lines. If you ever decide you want to move things or add a new one, it's always go to the dimension line, choose it, and you can say either if you right-click on the line, you get edit the witness lines, which lets you move an existing line. Actually, it'll let you add an existing one. That'll add. Edit's actually sort of a misnomer. It should really be add. The only thing you can do when you're editing is adding. The other thing you can do if you want to move one, you right-click actually on this little blue dot on the line itself, and then you can either move it or delete it. So I could move that line over to the other side or delete it, whatever it is I want to do. I'll dimension to that side instead. Yes? Oh, no worries. What happens is if you click on the line itself and right click, you can only edit, which is really to add a new one. If you want to move one, you click, it's actually on the witness line as opposed, that's called the dimension line, and this is called the witness line. On the witness line, you could right click on that and you can say move the witness line or delete it. Okay. So for example, over here, if I wanted to add a new line that actually picked up that window, I would, that would be an edit and pick up the window. And when I click back out there, it'll add it back in there. Okay. And again, these drive geometry too. So if you want to shove that window over an inch or two, you can actually just click on the window. It's always the part that kind of confuses people. You don't click on the dimension line to edit it. What you do is you click on the window, and that gives you the dimensions in blue text. So you can go ahead and change them like that. Yes? You know, when you keep the dimensions up, right? You can have your because Yes, you can. That is a very good question. Here's the deal. We created a single view. We're going to add some more annotations to it. But here's the deal. When we go and do it, you get a choice. It's always the source case. This is my floor plan. Here's kind of my overall floor plan. Let's say I'm going to do a couple of different sub plans. I'm going to duplicate this. I'm going to create a furniture plan. I'm going to create a framing plan. I'm going to create some different plans out of this. So what we're going to do, we'll keep on adding some more dimensions here in a minute, annotations, is we're going to start duplicating views and then filtering different things in and out of the view. So here's first floor. Let's duplicate that. When you say duplicate, you really get two big choices. I never use duplicate as dependent. I always either duplicate or duplicate in detail. If you duplicate, okay, that will get the model elements that won't get any of the annotations. Duplicate with detailing should probably really say duplicate with annotations, because that's what it does. It is, it's really the question of when we copy this, do I want those dimensions, do I want any text, do I want any tags to come to? Or would I prefer to start out with a raw model again? And often it is a good idea to duplicate with detailing. You can always really quickly eliminate the dimensions that you don't need. You know, and since those dimensions are local to a single view, if you take them out in one view, it doesn't affect the other view. So it's making a separate copy of the dimensions. So let me say duplicate with detailing. This is going to be now, I'll call this, oh, what am I going to call this? I'll call this my framing plan. It's got the dimensions here. I got my first floor. I got my framing plan. Let's talk about what my framing plan might be different and how it might be different. Different things about the framing plan. I might want to go ahead in my framing plan, for example, uh, not go ahead and show all the furniture because maybe the furniture isn't so necessary for the framers to see. It's more, I want my client to see that type of stand space, but I don't necessarily get the people framing it up need to see where the furniture is going to be. So this is going to get to this whole issue of filtering. The best way of filtering is something called visibility graphics. Actually, it's visibility graphics overrides. I always just call it visibility graphics. And where that shows up, again, it's a view setting, and it's right up here. 
What that does is it gives you essentially like a big filtering list that you can turn on and off different objects or customize the appearance to give them a custom color, a custom line weight, and half of them, make them transparent. There's a lot of things we can do here. But one thing I'll do just as a starting point here is I'm just going to turn off the furniture. So I'll find the furniture category. Say OK. So it went away. I still got the plumbing fixtures and stuff like that. Yeah, I can keep the plumbing fixtures. There are a lot of times the framers want to know where the plumbing is going to be, so you can kind of think about where the pipes are going to run and things like that. You know, I can emphasize or de-emphasize them. For example, if I want them to be there, but I want them to be there, oh, more as a half tone, more of a ghost to let you just sort of know they're there, but not necessarily say that's the most important thing. I can go back to visibility graphics again. And what I'll do is I'll find plumbing fixtures. For plumbing fixtures, I'll just make them half-toned. OK, they're out there. Casework, I'll decide whether I want to show the casework or not. Maybe I'll turn that off. Visibility and graphics, I'll turn off the cabinetry. OK, so now I have something which is more like just a framing plan view. OK, we've made all these changes to the framing plan. Notice they're not affecting our first floor plan. So I can start to have different information for different audiences. It's still all going to be coordinated, but I don't need to show everyone all the same things. Okay. Now, for someone else, for example, the person who has to order all this furniture that's going to be sitting in the room, you might want to go ahead and have a different view. I can duplicate a view. And again, you can decide whether you want to keep the dimensions coming or not, either duplicate or duplicate with detailing. I can call this view the furniture plan. <coughs> Now for the furniture, oops, there it is. For its visibility graphics, again, we can decide whether we want to hide things or show things. What I'm going to do for the furniture plan, just to really make it incredibly obvious what I have in mind for them, is I'm going to choose furniture. But rather than turning it off, I can do something called putting an override on it. So I can basically, oh, give it a different either color or a line weight. It's going to sort of beef it up a little bit so it's a heavier line weight. And why is that not showing up? I think yeah, you guys are. Oh, is that? I got... One, oh, say again? Go on to the graphics. Yes. Oh, well, that's certainly a very bad thing. Thank you. <laughs> Which we can't see anyway. Clear those overrides. There we go. Okay, so now the furniture is sort of standing out a little bit differently. Okay, but the idea is it's always create the different views you want and filter either highlight or eliminate whatever it is to kind of give people the information they want. And then start just adding annotations. You really want each of these views to communicate you know, the information that the people need who are going to be using it. Now, you know, we talked a little about sort of annotate dimensions. That's okay. Text is really easy. Let's kind of show you text. Text is sort of very, very similar. Oh, when you have something like this, you know, it's kind of hard sometimes for people to look at this plan and know what that is. I know that's a bookshelf because it can hover over it, but if I was looking at it as a piece of paper, you might not know what that is. So you might want to start adding some uh, text to the drawing. A lot of times, yeah, don't underestimate the power of text. You know, words actually do paint an awful lot of pictures. So sometimes when I'm modeling, I've got five minutes left and I have to turn it in, and I really can't make the perfect 3D model. Put a piece of text in there describing what you're going to put, you know, you would like to model. You know, we all run out of time when we're modeling. You know, don't, don't underestimate or forget that text can actually convey a lot of imagery too. So I'll say annotation. For text, when I put it in there, I got a couple different things. Under text, you have this choice of really, are you just going to put sort of straight text or are you going to put some sort of leader kind of pointing to the text? Is it going to be justified to the left or justified to the right? And also, for the you put a leader in there, should the leader come from the top of the text block, from the middle, or from the bottom? It's a lot of different options in terms of thinking about it. Ultimately, you'll start playing with a bunch of different variations, but I usually put leader or text in. If I'm just going to put a label right in the middle of something, I'll put it like this. There's no leader. If I want to sort of uh, kind of call it off to the side, like a call out, I'll go ahead and put a leader. Let me go ahead and I'll put some like center justified text, for example, in first. 
And I'm just going to put a label right on this book shelf right over here. And where, where did you go? Okay. What you got to do is, under the annotate tab, on my screen's a little bit squishy, but there should be like some big old A that looks like text. And what happens is if you choose that, there's a special little sub menu that shows up that says modify text. And then under there, you should have those options. Yours may not be collapsed. Yours are probably all still showing just over on the side because you have a little more screen space. Okay, so here we got just a little plain text annotation. Again, that text annotation is, it's a size because we sort of chose a size here. I can make it smaller or bigger or whatever it is that I want to do. I can move it around. It also has a little handle over on this side. You can rotate it. Okay. And you can also copy it around. And a lot of times when you're working with text, you may want to go through and take that piece of text. Sometimes it's a little hard to select. There it is. You know, I can copy it and give myself a new one and put it in several different places. So copying and pasting works. Is there a way to lock the text? Let's say you want to move the bookshelf and you want to keep the text. Can you... That's a good one in terms of that. Can I even align it? Can I lock it too? That's kind of a good question. I don't think I can. That's a very interesting thing because I think it's almost the text belongs to the drawing or the bookshelf belongs to the model. That's a, that's a very good question, but I don't know that right offhand. We could get smart about this and actually in our bookshelf component put the text in there so that it's always centered on the object and it moves with the object. That's probably the way I would do that in the long run. Okay, but hold that thought. That's a good thought about how to do that. Good idea. Okay, another part of text that you might want to do is if you want to have text with a little bit of a leader, let's talk about that. I can say text, give myself a leader. A leader is like one of these guys. You can decide whether you want it to be straight, two segments, or a hook. I usually do these little two segment ones. So I can say, okay, these are going to be file cabinets. Okay, text is okay. The problem with text, text is not nearly as good, though, as actually having a tag. <coughs> text, again, is dumb. It doesn't really understand what it is. There's no relationship back to the database, the names in the database, and stuff like that. So text is OK. It's your kind of first friend in terms of what's going on. The next level down, though, that is probably even more useful to you is something called tagging. Tagging, again, gets to the information that's in the database and lets you pull that out. So what sort of things do we usually tag? At a real rough level, and like this, we typically tag the doors and windows because they don't have a size. You can't really see the size here, and you want to relate the things that you're seeing here back to a schedule that actually lists all those different sizes, so you can order them. And here's how tagging works. It's right next to text. It's just right over here beside it. We can choose to tag, and we can choose typically to tag by categories. And let me show you what happens. Okay. If I hover over a door, there's something called a door tag that's available. Okay. We can decide whether we want to have a leader, a leader being something that kind of pulls off or not have a leader. Let me show you what it looks like if it doesn't have a leader. If I don't, it will show up, it's like right in the middle of the door opening, right there. So I'll put, let me put it in there first and show you. I'll put a tag on this door. I'll put a tag on that door. I'll just trust it. I know what it's going to do. Okay. So there are doors one, two, and three. And where are those numbers coming from? Those are actually marks, different ID numbers for the doors. They're in the database. If we choose the door and look at its properties, you'll see that that door actually has a type mark or has a mark of door number one. If I change it over here and make it door number 15, it'll show up over there. Same thing, the tag is bi directional. You can choose the tag change the text over there, and it'll change in the database. So either way, they, the two work together, one way or the other. In terms of thinking about whether you should put leaders on or not, often for interior doors like that, I'll put them just right in the middle of the door frame as opposed to putting the leader in there. What I'll tend to do for things like this one, though, which is sort of on the outside, is I'll often add the leader to that one and pull it just outside. Okay. So I sort of have it, and that's kind of really gross looking. I put two hooks on it. 
I'll just put it on the outside of the building like that. But again, it's strictly a matter of choice. You've got to figure out how it's graphically going to lay out. But you can tag doors like this. You can also go ahead and tag windows. For example, all these little windows that are down here. Let me go ahead and pull the dimension down even further. You might notice that I just pulled your annotation outside the crop area. And this is actually sort of a choice now. We can decide whether we, when, we, when we crop, we want to crop off the annotations or whether we want the annotations to be able to exceed the cropping area. A lot of times we need to do that. But for these windows, I can tag them. And I'll tag that window, and that window, and that window. And this is kind of interesting. Are, are these all B's or are they all E's? No, they're all B's. They're just kind of showing that way. These are all the B windows right now. Okay, this window over on the side here I think is probably different. And this window over here is probably a little bit different. Oh, those two are actually the same. So you can, as a matter of fact. Oh, you're so right about this. Let me undo all these things. You could do it that way. Another way you can do is say tag all, okay, which is sort of what you're asking for, kind of said, said in the opposite way. If you say tag all and you basically say tag everything that is a window with a window tag and give it a leader, okay, that'll really quickly get you all the window tags in there. I guess there's a window over here there in the bathroom. I'm just not seeing it right now. Okay, so you know, go ahead, tag all. That's the real quick thing. Again, you have the drawing. You have to get it turned in in like three minutes. You don't have time to go tagging there individually. Just tag all. It's better to have the information, even if it may be a little bit messy. It's better to kind of get the information out there where we can see it. Yes. Why um, are those interior doors actually different, and why is the number different? That's okay. This is sort of a funny. It's a convention, and we'll get to that. What happens is, for every tag, you get to decide. Let me choose the tag. See what kind of choices we are. It's kind of it depends on how the window tag is defined. Window tags tend to be defined by what's called the type mark. So all the windows tend to share the same type mark. Doors, don't know why, is typically by convention are typically numbered individually. Okay, so that's so there's the uh, instance like with the mark and with the type mark. There's two different ones, and you really have to choose which one you want to have. Let me show you how you can fix that. So for example, these are all right now sort of, they're not the individual window. If I edit that, you'll see that window actually has its own mark. That's window number 20, but it's type B. Okay, you get to kind of choose what you want to have in there. So let me finish that out, cancel that out. So the door over here, which was door number one, if you want them to all be the same, what you can do is this, here's the tag. Take a look at sort of what's in there. It doesn't give you very much information in there. What I'm going to do is actually edit the tag family. This is going to be something we're going to eventually do when we start customizing things. But if we edit the tag family, you'll see this is how the tag is defined. And that's the piece of text. The label is currently defined to be the mark. If you'd prefer to actually have the type mark show up as opposed to the individual mark, what you can do is over here, just choose type mark, put it there instead. Pull that back out. Okay. Another thing people will do that they sometimes like is though, even instead of the post of the mark, if you just really want to be really simple, you could just have a tag which is the, the height by the width. <coughs> put that right in there too. If you don't want to put a separate schedule in there, if you wanted, you click to get that. Okay. What you got to do is. I'm on that part. Okay. Yeah, um, choose the little label guy and then edit the label. All right. Let me go ahead and add some more things here. If I wanted to go ahead and put the uh, width. OK, let me put a break in there. I'm going to put the width. OK, I'll put an X in there. And then I'll put the height in here. I now have a very custom sort of thing. It'll have a number as well as it'll have the width by the height in there. So if I say OK, I might need to sort of stretch that out a little bit. Okay. The graphics are going to be a little off right now. We need to clean that up, but let me kind of give you the effect. I'll overwrite this. Okay, so it's a little squishy now. I need to sort of expand it a little bit further, but can you see it's, it's actually door two that's 210 by 68. Okay, so you can decide really what you want to have in there. It's a, whether it's tight mark, 
you know, individual mark, some key dimension of it, whatever it is that you want to do. Let me edit that family again. Maybe that's a little bit too much in there. I'll edit this label. I'll just go ahead and put the width in there. I'll remove that one. That way I can sort of very quickly confirm that, oh, they are 32 inch doors or something like that. I can see that's a two foot 10 door. So you get to choose whatever information you want to have popping through. Okay. So think about tags and think about really where you want to have the tags occur. Okay. You can have the tags go ahead and, well, in this case, I put them in the furniture plan, which is probably not the best place for the tags. If I want to go ahead and move something like that, for example, here's the furniture plan, and I want to grab those tags. Let me show you how you can sort of manipulate them. I could go back to the, uh, let's just do that. Let me go to the framing plan. Kind of per your suggestion, we'll have the framing plan here, and we'll just say really quickly under annotate, let's just going to tag all the windows as well as the doors. Okay. We'll make that happen. Okay, that was kind of a quickie in terms of making them all happen there. Back over here on the furniture plan, if I want to get rid of them over here, I could go through and kind of one at a time, go knocking them all out, do all that. Other ways I could do this are on the furniture plan, I could select them all. I'll show you a couple different variations. I could go ahead and select them all. Then filter, so I only choose the door in our window tags and the door tags. That's one way to do a selection if you want to grab a bunch of things. You can select them all at once. So I, now I can delete them because I've selected them again. What I'm doing, this is something called filtering that you'll do a lot of. You'll select a whole bunch of stuff just by dragging through it and turn on the filter to go through and choose the specific categories you want. So I'll typically say none, then only choose the ones that I want. But this is good for any sort of selection when you have to do a really quick selection of a bunch of things. Another way, hopefully not to confuse it too much, is we could also just say, Let's take the visibility of graphics and just hide the tags. It's another way. That way you can have them and make them disappear, disappear sometimes. So view, visibility graphics. Tags are actually something called an annotation category. So if I go on down to the window tags, I can hide them, or the door tags and hide them. So the way I think about this, if you've done the big master plan and you've put all this information in there, Okay. And then you want to create some sub plans and you don't necessarily want all the information to show up in the sub plans. Rather than going through and delete, yeah, duplicate with detailing, get them over there, but then if you can, use visibility and graphics just to hide them from you, as opposed to having to delete them out every time. Okay, because visibility and graphics, the nice thing is they are there, you just can't see them right now. So if you ever decide that you do want to return them, you just turn them back on again. Okay, so it's kind of a really useful thing to do in terms of like uh, just being able to kind of uh, quickly turn off and turn on from turn on things and kind of customize them. Okay, so that's kind of the notion of tags. So so far so good in terms of what you're doing there. You're just pretty much grabbing all those things. Yeah, this is actually looking like a pretty good drawing now in my mind. It's got some dimensions. Maybe add some let's add some labels to this too. Just in here. I'll do that relative to rooms and we'll go down that whole path. Okay. About the only thing missing from this drawing right now is that one can be the of room labels and stuff like that. So let's talk about how you can do that. So rooms are a funny kind of class of object because most of the objects we've been dealing with so far are like real physical objects. You can kind of pick them up and move them and load them off the truck and the real things. Rooms are kind of an abstract object. Okay, but they exist, we just have to kind of define them in a funny way. Um, as we go through and we want to think about where the rooms are and how much space this building actually contains, under architecture, you'll find a whole series of little tools over here that'll help you with rooms. And here's how they work. If you go through and you say that you want to create a room, like the first floor over here. Okay. That's funny. It actually just did an auto highlight there. You just put them all over the place. That's interesting. That was real quick. Or did you create rooms already? Or I think yeah, that no, I you did not. That's I interesting. Did, did. Oh, you did. Yeah. Okay, very good. Let's take out your rooms and show people how you can do it if you haven't. Can you still have your model? So you're you're in good shape. Okay. 
Over here in the rooms, you choose that tool. You kind of come zip it on down into an area. And for example, it'll show us, hey, okay, that looks like a room. How is it determining that's a room? It's saying, I found four continuous walls, or at least a series of walls that are forming a continuous boundary. I bet that's a room. And it'll even tell you it's 82 square feet. I can come over here and say, hey, this looks like a room too. Click in there. This thing out here interprets as one big room. Okay, that's kind of okay. Yeah, as one big room, what it's doing is saying, well, you know, there's no separation here. I'm going to go all the way around. It's really this big L-shaped room. That's kind of okay. Sometimes we go ahead and have tag our rooms like that. That's 361 square feet of open space plus entry. But if you like, if you want to think about some open area as being subdivided, for example, maybe this is only a useful space and all of this is really like a hallway or entry or something like that. You can take something that doesn't have a wall boundary and actually say that it's a room boundary too. And here's how that works. Under the rooms, you have the idea of creating rooms, but you also have something called a room separator. And what's that? A room separator is just a line that you can draw that artificially says, this is a separate part of the room from that part of the room. Just gives you two separate pieces. So I can choose room separator. And I'm just going to sort of draw a little separator line between that side and this side. Okay, again, that separator won't show up when we print. That's only something here for us. When we separated the room, we're not sure if you notice, this actually dropped down quite a bit. It used to be 380, it dropped down to 290. So I can now go ahead and make a room on this side. Now, these rooms are being tagged. These are just room tags. So room, we have a room number here. So we have room 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Actually, if you like to check out yours, they would normally start with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So in 5, 6, 7, 8, because I took out your rooms. We've created the different rooms. They're reporting a tag in here. For the room, you can sort of say whether you want to have the area or not. The area is often sort of nice to report, at least when we're doing space planning, something like that. And yeah, this is looking pretty good. And if you go through and add these things up, and start figuring out how many square feet in the building. Now, to be perfectly honest, we can't really say how many square feet are really in the building all together because it's going to give us the interior area of all the rooms and added up. So not quite the same. You know, if we're really doing area calculations in the sense that we have to do them for a real estate class, there's something else called an area we can use where we draw a boundary around the outside spaces. So it turns out you wouldn't think it really added up that much, but all that area in the walls really does add up to be a lot. Yes? So like that, maybe the Yes. It's more the interior. Okay. So it should be around 5A, around 47 should be good, somewhere in there. Okay, so this is always meant, but in real life, yeah, rooms are always measuring just to the interior, not to the, uh, the full exterior. Yes? Uh, if, like the example right there where the room starts talking from 5, is there a room to be set from newly? Uh, if you have to go into the Let's think about if there is an easy way, because I would like there to be, but I don't think there is. But let's show you how to schedule them, and it will make more sense. It will make it easier there. So it's going to segue into the next thing, but I think it will be an easy answer to your question. Okay, here's the deal. I got windows, I got doors, I got stuff, I got rooms, I got all sorts of stuff. I'm doing all these nice graphical views. They're pretty cool. The problem is, like, if I really want to tally up all this different square footage, you know, I can take out my calculator and do it, but, you know, computers are smart. They know how to add columns and numbers, so we got to let it do it for us. So all those sort of tabular views that let us access that stuff are showing up or hiding under the View tab as something called a schedule. So if you say View, you'll actually find something that lets you create schedules. And under schedules, if we go to, say, schedule of quantities, we can pull on down. And what I'm going to schedule is the rooms. Say OK to that. What do I want to show about my rooms? These rooms have, there's a name. There's a number. The number is that little number that's showing up in there. You can say what the occupancy is. 
Something like that. People might want to know that. You could also put in there the area. Yeah. Okay. So if I go ahead and say OK to this, I'll get something that looks like this. So here's, now you were really good. You went ahead and made your schedule already, and I wiped out your good looking rooms. But we'll fix that. Okay, so I got a schedule here. Here are the first four rooms that I wiped out, and then it's the new rooms five, six, seven, eight that I placed. If I want to go through and change the information about the rooms, let me go ahead and first I'm going to knock out the rows that aren't being placed right now. So this is a room. I'm going to delete that row. In fact, I can basically grab all three of those rows because those are unplaced rooms. They're sort of abstract concepts that don't have a space. I'll delete all three of those right now. Okay, it's like a little table. So we can go ahead and kind of knock them out that way. And then the easiest way is to go back and put them back in here. Because what you're doing is it's the same stuff. Doesn't matter whether I edit, edit, edit it to the tag, it doesn't matter whether I edit it to the properties palette or I edit it to the table. Any of those ways all just are putting information to the database. You go through whichever way sort of makes the most sense to you. Okay. Similarly, we can go ahead and put the occupancies in there. Like, what is one, two, three, four? Let me kind of I'll do it back over in the floor plan so I can actually see. So what was one? One is actually my storeroom. So if I did it properly. See if I can select the room. The rooms are a little hard to select because they're there. Okay, so oh, what is the name of this? This is going to be the storeroom. Room three over here. That kind of looks like uh, like my work room or something like that. Room four over here. That's like the bath. Notice I don't have to be entering them over here in the schedule. I could just be entering them right here in the tag. I'll just put, oops, went too far. Call that the entry. So I can get them either way. Okay, let's go back to that schedule again. I have my room schedule. Notice it's putting them all in here. Last thing you may want to do your room schedule is to think about actually summing up all these things so you can actually see how close you are to 500. And how you do that is if you have a schedule, you can always go back and you can edit things, put in different fields if you want to sort of put different fields in here. How you end up doing subtotals is like this. You go through and sort things. Let me go ahead and I'll just sort it by the, the number. I'll put a, some sort of a line, a footer at the bottom, okay, that'll have some a subtotal in it. And you'd think that'd be enough, that just sort of saying that you want to have a subtotal line there would do what you want it to. It's not quite enough. You have to go one step further and say formatting, and choose formatting, and actually choose what it is that you do want a subtotal. I'll make that right. Justified. Okay, so you have to sort it, put the blank line under it, or a, a subtotal line on it, and then finally go through and say which column you want a subtotal. Oops, yes, didn't quite get it. No worries, okay, let's do that again. Actually, I did sort of a funny thing here. I sorted them by number. Let me do this. I'm going to revise my uh, assumption. I'm going to sort them by number again. I'm not going to put a footer at the bottom of every number because that's actually sort of subtotaling by room number, which wasn't a very smart thing. I'm going to go to the grand total. I'll put a line down there to total that up. Okay, That's basically saying, do I want to put a subtotal line under each of these, or do I only want to put it at the bottom of the schedule? Okay. And then the final thing is you have to go to the formatting tab and actually choose which of the different fields it is that you want to calculate the total for. So I'll choose area, and that's what I want to calculate a total for. I'll say OK. OK, so I see I have a whopping 489 square feet in here. And that's looking pretty good in terms of what we want to be building. Now, for your projects, you know, if you're 489, super. If you're 503, super. If you're 525, OK. 675. You're pushing that. If it's 2,000, you've gone too far. So pull on back some. So, you know, again, no one's holding you to 500. The planning commission would hold you to the actual 500 or something like that. We're going to be a little imp imprecise about that. So, but don't go if you've come up with some beautiful design and you've labored it through and you've turned out to be 20 square feet over. You know, don't don't waste your time doing that. We'll think we'll find 20 feet eventually to squeeze out of it. 
go ahead and present your design concept based on how it is now. Okay? But coming around 500, that should be fine. Okay. The other type of schedule that's a really useful one, and there are already some that are defined in your project, are the window schedule and the door schedule. The window and the door schedule will show things like the door number and the width, things like that. And those are really good because you can pull that information out into this tabular format and kind of real quickly see that door number one has this size and a certain manufacturer model or number. So for example, if I know that door is going to come from the Simpson Door Company, I can just put that in there as a piece of information. Oh, what is it? This is going to be my exterior door. Yeah, you can start putting information in there, and that's okay. You can go through and just start tagging information that you want to see on the sheets. Okay. Where this all ends up at the tail end of all this, after you've created some different views and you've created some different schedules and all the information you want to put together, is you have some sheets, and let's kind of see how your sheets are looking now. So I'm going to go on down to your floor plan sheet. It's looking good. Looks like my annotations are in there. I have the first floor plan there. I got that 3D view. Oh, check that out. You did a whole render layer. That's actually kind of nice in terms of the square footage. That's another way of doing it. You did it with areas in terms of understanding. That's just sort of another way to do it. You know, you're reporting the square footage of the rooms there. That's kind of OK in terms of what you're doing out there. That is kind of the roof plan. That's looking fine. Oh, what else we got going on here? In your elevations, they're looking good in terms of all those different sizes. Oh, I should show you, you can also tag in elevation views. No harm there. For example, here we are in the elevation view. If I go back to that elevation, that's my south elevation. If I want to tag these, I'll annotate. I'll tag all the windows. Okay, and all the windows are sort of tagged there. We can decide if we want to move them or put leaders on them or what we want to do. Those are the windows that are hanging around the side. That's what's going on there. Let's go over to the uh, north elevation. Okay, let's tag that one too. Tag by ca tag all the windows. These are the ones that are hanging around the side that you can barely see. The nice thing about even tagging in these views, if you decide, oh, that's not Windows 67, I really want that to be Windows C, I can change it there. And again, I've changed it everywhere throughout the project. So those are looking good. Schedules, look at you. You got your schedules all set up here in terms of the room schedule, the door and um, window schedule. Let me go ahead and just sort of suggest one other way of thinking about it, because you did actually really great in terms of what's going on here. How about this? I'm going to take out your area plan here. We can put it again somewhere else. You can take things off just by deleting them, put it on a different sheet if you want to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that, oh, where did I call it? The framing plan. I'm going to put that on here. Okay. It would actually be very good if I did this, if I took that framing plan and I lined it up with the overall floor plan. That way people can sort of see very clearly how things kind of track across. Then a good thing to do underneath that is, you know, you have your door and window schedule. Let me go ahead and pull that out over here. I'm going to take it off over here. Like most of the views can only be on a single sheet at a time. I can go back over here and on the floor plan view, think about maybe next to the framing plan, that's a good place to think about having the door and window schedule. Because what I like about doing something like that is as you're looking there and you're seeing window B, you can go right down to the schedule and sort of see what window B is. So is that one-to-one -one correspondence. If you get all the information that someone needs on one sheet, much higher likelihood that when they take the one sheet out of the job site, they'll have what they need. And so if you keep all that stuff together, that is really, really handy. So all the sort of framing stuff, the window schedule, maybe put the door schedule there. Just think about how people are going to use your information. What is the most important stuff to keep you there? Because that's really what it's all about. It's, you know, we create nice and clean sets of documents, but ultimately it's all about how they're able to use it and find things. Because if they put it on the sheets and they can't find it, and a lot of times people aren't all that creative. If they can't see it on this sheet, they assume it doesn't exist. They don't know that you created a fantastic detail they need five sheets back. So they try to build it and never look at your detail. So 
make sure that everything's always cross-referenced and have notes to kind of point to things where you need them. Okay, but go ahead and create some sheets. At the tail end of all this, what you guys are going to do is you're going to take all this stuff, put it on sheets, and you're finally going to go ahead and create something called the DWF file out of it. So DWF, what is that? It's kind of like a PDF, only as opposed to just being a lot of lines that would be printed paper, it actually stores the actual model information. So let me show you where that comes, or how that shows up in Revit. In Revit, we can say that we are want to go through and export this thing. We could just say print to a PDF and just plot it out somewhere, but if I want to sort of transfer model information that I could use for estimating or someone else can query the model, I create a DWF file. So DWF is up here. When you choose DWF, you get to sort of choose which sort of things you want to include. And right now it's only looking at that one sheet, it would just be sort of this printed view. I'm going to actually have you shift it around a little bit because if you give me a slightly different set of information, I get more power. If I shift to the in session view sheet set, then go to the all views and sheets in the model, so you have to make two different choices, you actually get a choice of all the different things you want to go through and include. So all the 3D views are here, all the elevation views are there, all that stuff's available. Now, you don't want to sort of include them all. You really do want to include your sheets, because I do want to get all three of your sheets. That's good, because that's what I plot out. But what is really very useful of all of these different things, if you can go ahead and include also this one, the default 3D view. Okay? If you can include that, we get a very special thing. What will happen is not only will we get all the flat views on the sheets, we'll actually get your 3D model. Okay? And then we can navigate around with it, post it to the web, whatever it is we want to do. Now, you've made a nice set of selections over here. You may want to actually go ahead and save this away okay? so that I can kind of keep on doing it again. Let me go back and export it again. I think I clicked the wrong button and didn't do what I wanted to. Okay. Here it is. I got those sheets. I got all that type stuff. Let me say next. I'm going to go ahead and put it somewhere out there, like in my documents folder. And I'll say, oh, this is my assignment one. A very good thing to do would be to go through right up front and put whatever your name is in front of there. Because if we get a bunch that all say assignment one, it gets really hard to sort it out. Who's is which? Say okay to that. And we're sending them all away. Now, why do I like it in terms of doing all that stuff? Let me show you what happens when you actually send us that thing. I'll go back to, where did it go? There it is, cat's assignment one. Here's what, oh, come on you, don't do that to me. My machine gets very confused. Autodesk design review. I'll show you what it looks like when we get those things. Design review is kind of the, it, design review is to DWFs what PDF reader or Acrobat reader is to PDF files. Okay. Yeah, let me go ahead and open that up. I'll go to documents. Come on down. Say that we want to get that guy. Okay. And here's the deal. Well, I not only have your sheets, I got your sheets that look good. I can plot them. I can, you know, print those out. I can distribute them. Nice looking sheets, well laid out. Things are looking good. But I also have the model view that I can then start orbiting around and navigating around in. So let me put it on the turntable. It'll be a little easier to work with. Or I can do things like walk into it. Yes? Well, it's interesting. Well, the, what is true view? Isn't true view something just for distributing, like copying between like uh, like DW DG versions? Like what? But show me what true view is, because I always think of it as being designer. Give me one that you sell. Don't um, I think the true view is really, if I am not mistaken, that is just something that lets us open different PWG files and kind of translate them to different countries. You didn't give me this on your view already? Sure. 
go to go to inside your Autodesk folder. Is it in there? Yeah. Go inside your Autodesk folder. It may not have put a desktop icon. Let's see if you go in there and something find design review. Oh, maybe one of those ones that we had to like uh, like when we installed, we have to check out to make sure it gets added in there. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, you, know, you won't actually need it. It's good just for verifying what's going on. But the nice thing about design review is with this DWF file, we can go through and things like, oh, you know, start walking in and looking around your building. I think I want to walk. There we go. Oh, it's being slow. Let me pan that down. Let's see if I can walk in now. It's being too incredibly slow. There we go. Oh, do the shift key to speed up. But the nice thing is with this, even though you haven't actually given me your model file, I can go ahead and look around, <laughs> see how things look, really understand it this way, which is actually a great way for just being able to share models with people who don't actually have the Revit software. They can do this very lightly in terms of sort of understanding it all. Normally, we're showing how you can take things like this and put them in the gaming room, so you, you can come up with what you do with that. Or uh, just any sort of video game, you navigate around through the uh, with the house and area keys and walk around and explore the entire model. So lots of cool stuff here. Okay, but let us go ahead and break for now in terms of what's going on. So your task is to go ahead and do this. How about make sure you get all your stuff finished up in terms of the view, blah 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 blah, your schedules, get them all on sheets, and get that DWG file created so that ultimately you can put that up on the L drive at some point. Um, let's say, uh, oh, whatever, by tomorrow morning. Okay, so we'll give you some you know, time here to go ahead and get it all finished up. If you want to kind of keep on working into the evening, that's fine. Don't feel like you have to excessively perfect. If you already got something that looks pretty good, just get your sheets cleaned up and get it turned in. Because again, no one's going to sort of fine tooth comb. This is really more, I want to make sure you just have the experience of getting the modeling, doing the annotations, and getting it on sheets, just so you can really say that you've been through the whole cycle from start to finish. Okay, so then, you know, no one's going to be looking at it. That one little thing doesn't quite join the other thing exactly the way. The countertop is floating two inches off the top of your cabinet, and no one's probably going to dog you for that. Okay, you know it's there. I know you know it's there. You want to fix it. Like, uh, you know, no way to stop. Okay, well, let's go ahead and adjourn for right now, and we'll see you guys this afternoon.